Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. In this video, I'm continuing my analysis into medical ethics. The books that I'm using, the first is Classical Works in Medical Ethics, so this book, and the second is Tough Decision, Cases in Medical Ethics, and this is the second edition. So I'm using uh, these two books for my medical ethics series, so these are the books that I'll be using. I'll be supplementing the books with other text, articles, hyperlinks to other stuff, blah, blah, blah. Um, in this segment, I'm going to be using my notes as I always use. Um, you can access the notes simply by clicking the link in the description field. It'll take you to the PDF. Just download the latest version of the notes. Make sure that you're up to date. Um, we're going to be talking about the four, and this is going to be section 1.1. We're on the bottom of page three in my notes. So we're going to be talking about the four principles um, and medical ethics in this section. So again, this comes from the text. Make sure you use my series to supplement your reading or your existing knowledge. Um, this should not in any sense, as I say with all my series, be the be-all, the end-all of your education in whatever the discipline it is that I'm discussing, right? The lecture series are a means of supplementing existing knowledge or in attempting you to gain further knowledge of information that you've already acquired. So with that, uh, let's begin. This is uh, medical ethics. And this is section 1.1. 1.1. Okay. And this is a discussion on the four principles and medical ethics. So the first principle um, that we're going to discuss and, and make sense of, and that, you know, this will hopefully be intuitive. This is not going to be necessarily very com complicated. It's a pretty basic idea. The first is um, autonomy. Sorry, autonomy. When we talk about autonomy, um, in the sort of colloquial sense, autonomy refers to the preservation of an individual agent's ability to act in the world, to choose, to make decisions, right? So that an autonomous individual is an individual that acts freely, right? We think of and we typically associate the word and the concept, generally speaking, autonomy with the idea of freedom, the idea of um, self-determination in a conflict resolution sense and so on, right? Uh, autonomy is patient-centered. And here's a quote from the text, direct quote. Autonomy refers to the right to make decisions, which is what I just said, the right to make decisions about one's own life and body. Right? So the two key things that we want to address here is the right and the decision. We want to observe an individual human's being right to make decisions concerning his or her own body. Right? And within the medical community, the medical community, as part of the creed that um, practitioners within the medical community make, it's important to make sure that we not only um, function in such a way that we do no harm, but that we as medical practitioners, and I'm not a medical practitioner, obviously you guys know that, but we as medical practitioners make sure that we recognize and observe and acknowledge the right to self-determination, the right for the patient to deny care and such and such and such and such. Okay, without coercion by others, right? So this, this that this right exists and it exists independent to coercive forces from the external world, from the medical community, right? The idea is that you can't properly be said to be autonomous, you can't, and I'm interested in this for more epistemological reasons, but with, this is not an epistemology lecture, this is a medical ethics lecture. The question is, you know, and it's very simple actually, the point is, the individual patient has the right to be um, autonomous, the individual patient has the right to have his or her autonomy respected, acknowledged, and as such, the existing medical community um, has a corresponding duty, right? So just really quick, anytime we talk about rights, we talk about rights in relationships to duties. 
So if somebody has a right to make a decision and that decision is free of coercion, then there is a corresponding duty to acknowledge that right. A corresponding duty is precisely what I just said, right? The duty not to coerce um, members of the, the, the patient population for whatever purposes, right? To the extent that their decisions do not harm others, individuals should be left alone to make fundamental medical decisions in effect, uh, that affect their own body. Okay, so again, that is page 13 of this text here. So that comes from page 13. Top of page 4, John Stuart Mill in On Liberty notes, and this is a direct quote, quote, over himself, over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign, right? So that in terms of sovereignty, obviously we're not talking about political sovereignty here. We're using so sovereignty more metaphorically, but the individual, John Stuart Mill says in On Liberty, that the individual, with respect to the governance of his own or her own body, brain supreme, right, is the sovereign of my own body. I have the right not to have coercive forces um, try to dictate or mandate the way in which I live my life provided it doesn't affect the lives of others. There's an interesting caveat here. Um, the, the interesting caveat that some of you should be thinking, and it's rather obvious, is then that this brings up the question of suicide, right? And the role and the responsibility with respect to the medical community and the right for an individual patient to want to die. What I'm going to do in the next section is I'm going to take this concept, specifically at this point in the discussion of autonomy, and we'll complicate it further with, um, with, a, with a really canonical discussion in the medical ethics field pertaining to um, euthanasia. And I've already done a lecture series on euthanasia, I don't want to jump ahead, but the idea is at this point, what you should be thinking in sort of critically assessing the information that I'm presenting is if it's the case that the medical community and medical ethicists already acknowledge that a patient has a right to autonomy, and it's the, it's the understanding that the, and the belief that the medical community has a corresponding duty to respect the patient's right to self-determination, then it should be the case that where patients choose to take their own lives, where patients go to the medical community to have their own lives ended, well, we can see that there's going to be a bit of a, a dilemma here, right? We're going to see that there's a bit of um, sort of conceptual difficulty here, and we'll talk about that more later in the lecture series. In the next hour or two hours, I'll discuss that. If you're thinking about that, if you understood the nature of my question, then you're fine. All right, so uh, this is A. The ethics of, so A at the top of page four, the ethics of autonomy is set in opposition to a virtue-based ethic. The ethic of autonomy is set in opposition to a virtue-based ethic which is characterized as paternalistic in nature. Right? The idea of paternalism is simple. Right? The idea of paternalism really has an imbalance in power. Right? There's an imbalance in power when we're talking about paternalism. You have the individual who has control and the individual who is controlled. And insofar as the individual has control, mom, dad, there is a mandate. Mom says, you know, I want you to wear your helmet, Bobby, when you go riding your bicycle. And Bobby thinks to himself, well, I don't want to wear a helmet because it looks ridiculous. Now, children, make sure you wear your helmets when you ride your bicycle. I came up in an era where people didn't wear helmets and I turned out well. However, I know that some kids didn't wear helmets and, you know, either lost their lives or were, you know, had suffered severe brain damage. So it's no joking matter, I'm not being light here. But the idea is, mommy wants you to wear your helmet, not because it helps mom in any real sense, per se, but that mom wants you to wear your helmet because it's what's good for you, right? This is paternalistic. And in a sense, you know, you have this paternalistic relationship with your parents, no matter how old you get. I'm a grown man now, and my mom, to this day, still treats me like her baby boy, and I act accordingly. <laughs> because I'm smart. Um, what we don't like, however, in terms of paternalism, is where this paternalistic overtone manifests within the state. Now, I'm not going to transition off into a discourse on that, because this is not the point of my lecture series on medical ethics. But the idea is that if we make the assumption that 